Ultimate has introduced more than enough new mechanics to keep us busy, but I don't think any mechanic is quite as intimidating as the new Perfect Shield mechanic, or as we lovingly now know it, colloquially, parrying. For those who don't yet know, parrying is different from old Perfect Shield mechanics in a way that's hard to understate. You now have to release shield upon being attacked rather than engage it to get a Perfect Shield or parry. This might seem trivial at first, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. Having to release shield rather than engage it carries two very important implications. One, inherent risk since you're sacrificing the safety of your shield if you mistime the parry. And two, maybe even more important than the first point, you absolutely cannot parry on reaction because a successful parry requires a total of five frames rather than a single frame in Smash 4. Adding four frames onto what are already the fringes of feasible reaction times makes parrying a distant notion on reaction. This being said, a lot of us are sort of struggling to know when it's worthwhile or even appropriate to parry. Our balls are the size of melons in friendlies when we don't carry any real risk for flubbing attempted parries, which can give us a false sense of confidence in our ability to execute them. But in tournament, we're noticeably more timid about attempting them. Because of the risk associated with parrying, we need absolute confidence in our ability to execute them, and so need to be pragmatic about when we do them. Generally speaking, you can divide potential parry opportunities into two distinct groups. The first of which I call the Karate Kid method. And for those who saw the original Karate Kid, there was a scene where Mr. Miyagi was teaching the young Daniel to snatch flies out of thin air with chopsticks. A young Link charging his fire arrow from across the stage is the fly, and your parry is the chopsticks. Young Link can hold the arrow as long as he wants, and to parry it, you have to, in essence, pluck a fly from the air with chopsticks by randomly guessing when he'll fire it. This is definitely not a good place to try parrying, much less when your tournament life is on the line. As a general rule, you want to be very careful about parries against moves that are time insensitive, like Link's arrows, with time insensitive here meaning that the arrow can be charged, making the timing unpredictable, or against moves in a neutral setting where there is no point of reference for exact timing like you would have in a buffering situation, let's say, such as acting out of shield after shield stun where timings are fixed and therefore predictable. For instance, Krom can delay or just subtly alter his nair timing to stuff parry attempts because in a neutral situation, by definition, he's under no obligation to use a given move at a given time. So, the bottom line about the Karate Kid method is something requires a reaction or whose exact timing you can't precisely predict, it's probably better to just shield normally. Some examples of this Karate Kid method, as I call it, projectiles that can be held or charged, e.g. Link's arrow, projectiles in general, though there are special cases which I will cover, and neutral interactions, such as trying to call out Krom's neutral air or something else in neutral. On the topic of points of reference, let's continue on. The second group of potential parry opportunities I call the critical moment method. I mentioned that in a neutral setting, Krom isn't obligated to any particular timings or really anything in general. The natural contrast is, of course, when someone is in fact obligated, at least barring some dangerously high-level Yomi, to act under definite time constraints imposed by the game, such as shield stun. We need these points of reference where certain timings are predictable and reliable to be confident in our parries. I call these points of reference critical moments. A critical moment, as I define it, is when the opponent must act within a definite time frame, usually beyond their control. This obligation to act could come from gravity, like Richter falling and needing to throw something at you, like in this clip. Or maybe from shield pressure, where you have to act as soon as possible with an aerial out of shield, like in this clip. Or an up smash, like in this one. Note though, you'll want to be cautious about what out of shield options you try to parry since you only have a 5 frame window after releasing shield to parry, and those 5 frames may elapse before their move becomes active, meaning you get smacked in the mouth. If you don't believe that a point of reference is important and that plucking strikes from thin air at odd intervals is a consistent strategy, 
Give a small child a magic marker, tell them to go nuts at you, and see if you emerge unscathed. Now, the bottom line about the critical moment method. If your opponent is in a situation where they're highly likely, or maybe even obligated, to make a move such that the timing is reliable and easily predictable, e.g. buffer situations like out of shield options, or multi-hit moves like Zero Suit Samus's forward smash, parry is, I claim, a practical option. Some examples of that would be, again, when your opponent is locked in a multi-hit move like Zero Suit Samus's forward smash, when you've just hit your opponent's shield and expect a buffer out of shield option, or special cases with certain projectiles. I've made mention of projectiles being a special case at least twice now, so let's finally take a look at how to regard projectiles with parries. Projectiles are just really weird, at least as they concern parrying. Ordinarily, attackers incur a minimum of 11 frames of freeze when their attack is parried, but projectiles do not share this property. That is to say, parrying a projectile doesn't cause the projectile user to suffer any freeze. This means the person parrying has to complete the parry animation while nothing happens to the projectile user. It's because of this, it's generally considered better to shield projectiles normally and simply circumvent the 11 frame shield release animation by jumping. This is mostly true. But the special cases in question are those where jumping out of shield or any of the other moves that circumvent the shield release animation, such as up smash or up B, aren't the best solution. So, there are a few questions to consider when determining if a projectile is indeed worth parrying or if you should just shield. First, is the projectile reactable from mid-range? We need to know this because random guessing and parrying just don't mix. Second, how much end lag does the projectile have? We need to know this to know if we have an opportunity to close the distance between us and whoever's throwing the projectile at us. Third and last, do we have a good burst option? We need to know this because the extra time we buy by parrying and using a grounded move instead of jumping is no good if we can't make our way in. Let's consider two scenarios. First is Young Link's boomerang. Is it reactable for mid-range? Yes. Is it pretty laggy? Yes. Do we have a good burst option? I don't know about you, but as Ganon, yes, I have wish kick. Though normal shield to jump is quicker than parry to whiz kick by two frames, you're not going to accomplish a whole lot by throwing short hop aerials at Young Link, who's half a stage away from you. Thus, in this case, all three criteria are met, so parrying a projectile like Young Link's boomerang is an advantageous use of parry. Now, consider Young Link's fire arrows. Is it reactable from mid-range? No. Is it laggy? <laughs> no. Do we have a good burst option? Yes. We're still Ganon, or at least I still am. And I have Whiskey. In this case, we're in a Karate Kid situation. Since the projectile is neither easily reactable nor laggy enough to be punished, you have to guess about timing and might not gain anything with your burst option even if you do manage to parry. Now, with all this said, parrying is a huge topic that will likely give rise to the deepest gameplay we've seen from Smash yet, and there's much yet to be explored. But it's beyond the intended scope of this video to give a full treatment of parrying and all the crazy opportunities for Yomi that it introduces. Rather, my aim is just to describe what I think are the principles for practical baseline usage of parries. In short, you shouldn't feel obligated to use parries. There are definite times, places, and reasons for them, and you should use them mostly from points of reference in those critical moments I detailed earlier, and only very occasionally use them raw as you would any other risky hard read. This video in particular was sort of just done on a whim, so don't worry, anyone who is looking forward to my next proper Smash Conceptions video about character choice and making sense of characters you want to understand but just don't click with immediately is still in the works. All the same, I do hope these guidelines help you feel just a little bit more confident in intelligently choosing your parry opportunities.